Our reading this morning will be from John chapter 9, verses 13 through 41. John 9, 13 through 41. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was the Sabbath on that day, or on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is, from, is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And so there was division among them. So they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews they did not believe in believe it of him and had been bl that he had been blind and received sight until they called the parents of the very one who received his sight and questioned them saying is this your son who you say was born blind then how does he now see his parents answered them and said we know that this is our son and that he was born blind but how he now sees we don't know or who opened his eyes we do not know ask him he is of age he'll speak for himself his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He then answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? They reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and, and does his will, he hears them. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and you are teaching us, so they put him out. Jesus heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not, who do not see may see, and those who may see become blind, or those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind... You would have no sin, but since you say, we see, your sin remains. Those of you who were here last week know that we talked about the first 12 verses of John chapter 9. We talked about the healing of the blind man. And that was, in some ways, a very basic lesson in and of itself. But I told you last week, the story does not end there. There is a continuation of it that we're going to examine today in verses 13 through 41. Once again, let me say this is not necessarily a part two lesson. This is simply a continuation of the same story. But I do want you to realize that it is important for us to understand just exactly what it was that we covered. So right now, I'm going to re-preach last week's sermon before I preach this morning's sermon. If you think that's not possible... Let's take a look at it. Here is last week's sermon in six, 60 seconds. First and foremost, we learned that a man was born blind. Secondly, the disciples thought that his blindness was due to sin. Whether it was his sin or his parents' sin, they didn't know. But Jesus very quickly corrected their error and explained that that is not the case at all. Then Jesus healed the blind man. You remember he did this with mud that he put together by spitting on the ground and making a mud type or a clay that he then placed on the eyes and he told him to take to go and wash his eyes with water and suddenly the blind man was able to see the people 
that were around him, including his own neighbors, disagreed as to what had actually happened. They had never seen something like this before. They had never experienced a true supernatural miracle of God. And so some of them thought that, yes, he was healed. Some of them thought, no, he wasn't. There must be some other explanation. And ultimately, while all of this is going on, Jesus disappeared from the scene of the miracle. Shall we all now stand and sing? No, we shall not. But that's last week's lesson in a nutshell. Twelve verses, just the facts. But now we get into this week's lesson. Now we get into the problems that Jesus healing the blind man caused. And you would think to yourself, how in the world would that be problematic? Why would that be a trouble to anyone? Jesus, who is God in the flesh, who does no wrong and only does good, is there taking a man who has never seen the light of day and giving him the ability to do so. How would that be wrong? Well, we're going to take a look this morning at what happens after the healing. And we're going to take a look at those who were denying the evidence after Jesus healed the blind man from John chapter 9, verses 13 through 41. 29 verses we're going to take a look at this morning, but it won't take as long as you might realize. Because as we've talked about in weeks past, there are sections to this story. And we're going to divide up those sections, kind of like you would see paragraphs in your Bible sometimes. And we're going to divide those up, and we're going to examine just exactly what is the root of the problem and the cause of these non-believers. Let's begin by asking the question regarding the first three sections of Scripture. Let's begin by asking the question, how did the Pharisees deny Jesus as Lord? Because who else but the Son of God would have such power? Who else but someone sent by God could heal someone who had never been able to see from the time of his birth? Well, first and foremost, from John chapter 9, verses 13 through 17, we see that they denied the evidence of the eyewitness. Now, I want you to consider for just a moment what, hap what is going to happen in the next few verses of Scripture because we're going to see something almost like a court case taking place. And we're going to see evidence presented, and we're going to see those who are going to deny that evidence. And the first evidence is presented by the eyewitness himself, the blind man who was actually healed. If you take a look at verses 13 through 17, you will find that one of the things that the blind man would testify to before the Pharisees is found in verse 15. He simply says, he applied clay to my eyes and I washed and I see. So he is simply declaring as a first-hand witness to what Jesus had done, he is declaring to the Pharisees that are present there that, yes, I was healed. Yes, I was blind, and yes, now I can see. Well, of course, the Pharisees are arguing that point. They're saying in verse 16, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Now, I want you to notice that's what was mentioned in verse 14. Now, it was, on, it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, and that seems to be the problem. Not so much that it actually was the seventh day of the week, the holy day under the law of Moses to the Jews, but the fact that this was simply another opportunity to try to get at Jesus and bring him down to take away his popularity amongst the people by saying he's breaking the law of Moses. He claims to be so good, he looks like he's doing good things, but here he is breaking God's law. How can he be good? Well, if you remember, we've already gone through this before. In John chapter 5, verses 8 through 13, you remember the lame man, another man who was that way from birth. For 38 years, this man was lame. And what happened to, what happened to him? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 11, or, or he told him in verse 12, pick up your pallet and walked. And that's exactly what happened. When that man testified as to what Jesus had said and done and that he was able to walk, that in itself was a supernatural, amazing event. But did you read what happened before? In verse 9 it says, now it was the Sabbath on that day. 
And that gave rise for the critics of Jesus to, to pound on him and try to make him look bad in the eyes of the people. Now, it is true that not all of the Pharisees felt this way. In John chapter 7, verses 50 and 51, we read about a fellow by the name of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a fellow who himself came to him, Jesus, you remember back in John 3, came to him by night asking him questions, realizing that he was a great and unique individual. And he says to his own Pharisees, he says in verse 51 of John 7, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? So as much as they wanted to basically skew the details and twist the truth, he says, now hold on just a second, let's reel it back in and let's make sure that we are operating accurately, fairly, and justly according to the law under which we live. Not everybody was a bad guy, but it is important to understand that most of these people seem to want to do just that. They wanted to twist the truth, they wanted to skew the details in their favor and against the favor of Jesus. They ultimately wanted nothing more than to regain the preeminence that they had not earned and had not been given to them, but that they had occupied during the time of Jesus' ministry. Why is it important to have a, an eyewitness to an account? Well, I want you to think about this for just a minute. If somebody is accused of stealing something and we have videotape, or we have an actual individual who says, I saw them, and they can give the details of that event, that lends credibility as to that person's guilt or the testimony that is being given. Same thing is true of a murder. If somebody actually saw the person holding the smoking gun or watched him or her pull the trigger and take the life of another, it would be very important in a court of law to be able to hear that eyewitness testimony. And I want you to think for just a minute about what happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you've got your Bibles, open there for just a minute, keep your finger in John 9, and go to 1 Corinthians 15, because I want us to recognize one of the most significant things in all of the New Testament regarding the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, typically, when we go to the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 15, we are usually doing this to define, as the Bible defines, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that the gospel means good news, but the ultimate reason that Jesus' gospel is good news is because of his death, burial, and resurrection. And that's the definition that's given to us. Look at verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. That is the good news by biblical definition, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But understand this, without an eyewitness to confirm these things, how can we conclude, in fact, that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God? You see, it goes on to say that although a lot of people saw Jesus alive and heard him and saw him do amazing things, and although a lot of people, including his own family, would see him hanging on the cross and ultimately buried in a tomb, how many people saw him rise from the dead? Because you see, the resurrection is the key to it all. We focus a lot on the cross, and as well we should, but realize that many people were crucified, only one came back from the dead. And this is what Paul writes to the church at Corinth, beginning in verse 5, that he appeared to Cephas after his resurrection, then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, or as Paul would mean, some have passed away at that point in time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me all. Before Paul was known as Paul, he was known as Saul. And you remember when he was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus quite literally came to him. Even though Jesus had already ascended into heaven, Jesus comes to him and asks him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul, formerly known as Saul, would ask, who are you, Lord? And he would explain to him, I am the, the Christ, I'm Jesus, I, I'm the one you're persecuting. And of course, that began Saul's conversion 
to the ultimate Christian and apostle we would know as Paul. You see, eyewitness account is very important, but to deny an eyewitness suggests that either that eyewitness is not credible or you simply want to dismiss it because you want to pursue another theme. In this case, it's kind of hard to dismiss a man who can clearly see, but that everybody knows has been blind from birth. How else did the Pharisees deny Jesus as Lord? If you take a look at verses 18 through 23, that next section of Scripture, you'll find that they denied the evidence of family testimony. We might call this a character reference because ultimately the Pharisees go and they interview the man's parents. They're not really getting the answers from the blind man, the formerly blind man that they wanted, and so they go to his mom and dad and they ask them questions. They questioned him in verse 19, and I want you to notice this question. It says, is this your son who you say was born blind, then how does he now see? Albert Barnes would write in his commentary that ultimately they're asking him three questions, and all of these questions are designed to gain some kind of advantage over Jesus based upon their testimony. We've seen lawyers sometimes ask in a court of law a question that ultimately tricks the witness on the stand to say something that he or she probably ought not to say or that gives that particular attorney in his position in the case leverage. And so ultimately they're saying, number one, is this your son? Number two, was he in fact born blind? And number three, how is it that he sees? Now I want you to listen to their testimony. In verse 20, we, they answer the first question, yes, he is our son. And yes, he was born blind. Now in verse 21, we read a little bit of a different take. They do acknowledge that he can see because the scripture reads that they said, but how he now sees, we do not know. So they acknowledge that he can see, but they're very quick to say, but we're not really sure how this happened. Now, perhaps, indeed, they did not know how it happened at that point in time. However, we do know something that is very significant they very quickly change the subject and say hey why are you asking us why don't you go ask him he's old enough to give testimony himself he's old enough to bear an account for what happened to him and we read in verse 22 that his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews people had already been making threats we read that the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, confess Jesus to be the Messiah, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Boy, how I would love to talk about Washington, D.C. right now. Boy, how I would like to talk about politics right now. Boy, how I'd like to talk about the Democrats and the Republicans who are supposedly running our country right now. But I won't. Other than to say this, there are a lot of people just this last week in Washington who were making decisions that they didn't really believe in. They were making decisions that they would not make if it were under the close of darkness. There were a lot of ballots or a lot of votes that were cast in various situations that perhaps they would have done it differently had it not been an open vote for the entire world to see. In fact, there were some people, there were about 10 people who voted a particular way on a particular uh, part of uh, the week's activities that some people have suggested if it had been done by secret ballot, probably 50 or 60 others would have joined them. But they didn't, according to these sources. Why? Because they were afraid of the backlash. They were afraid of the people. They were afraid of the, the political harm it might do them. They were afraid they might lose the next election. We've got the exact same kind of thinking taking place today as was taking place then. The parents very quickly say, go ask our son. Stop asking us because they were afraid of the consequences to their truthful testimony. They denied the evidence of family testimony. They, they denied the evidence of these character witnesses. You know, that reminds me of what we've studied in John chapter 7 verses 3 and 5 about Jesus's family. You might remember that in that particular 
passage of Scripture, Jesus' earthly brothers are challenging him to do something, which is really not in his best interest. He's the one that is guiding what is true and what needs to be done according to the Father's will. But we read this little caveat in John 7 and verse 5, for not even his brothers were believing in him. Not even his brothers were believing in him. But you know what? That changed. And in James chapter 1 and verse 1, the brother of Jesus writes this as an opening remark. He identifies himself as James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, calling his own brother his master, not simply an elder brother, but referring to Jesus as his Lord. He had a change. And let me tell you something, when family has a change of heart, which sometimes doesn't happen very often, but when they have a change of heart, that often means something. It may make some people even matter, but it may make some people believe even more what it is that they are testifying to that they once did not believe themselves. Jesus had another brother, Jude, and you might notice up there it says Jude 1. It doesn't give the verse. That's because Jude has one chapter. So that means verse 1 of the chapter-long book of Jude. Jude 1, Jude, the brother of Jesus, also says Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He is a servant to his brother, but not because he's the elder brother, but because he is the Lord and he is the Christ. When you bring in character references, when you bring in character witnesses, when you bring in their testimony, that may not be as great as that eyewitness testimony sometimes, but it's still important nonetheless as you gather the evidence. And what happened to the Pharisees? They didn't like what the parents said either. And so they denied what they said as far as what had happened to their son who was blind but now could see. So what do the Pharisees do? The Pharisees then go back to the blind man again. And that brings us to the third denial. How did the Pharisees deny Jesus as Lord? They denied the evidence of scriptural logic. They denied the evidence of scriptural logic. Logic. Now, when I was first writing out this outline, I literally wrote that sentence a different way. I said they denied the evidence of Scripture and logic, and that would have been just as fine. But I decided to kind of marry those two words a little bit better because I think this is exactly the kind of thing that God wants for us. He wants us to use Scripture, but he wants us to use logic or reason as well. We'll come back to this passage of Scripture in just a minute, but let me demonstrate this point to you. One of my favorite passages of Scripture in the Old Testament is from Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. And we're going to read 18, 19, and 20, but it's what the Lord says right up front in Isaiah 1 and verse 18. He says, come now and let us reason together. Don't get me started on Washington once again. I want them to be so reasonable, but these are some of the most irrational, illogical, just don't make sense any day of the week and twice on Sunday that I've ever seen in my life. What we're seeing in our country, the division that is just growing in our country because people are more concerned about their jobs and their money and their positions and their popularity and their title than they are about truth and what is in the best interest of this country literally drives me crazy. I don't share that attitude with you very often, but I'm just letting you know I'm in the same boat with you because I think most all of us are frustrated with people who are putting party and personal preference above the Lord and above this country and above what the people need as opposed to what they want. I'm frustrated with it right along with you, but I still have to remember that God is in charge. Jesus is still king. The world is in his hands, and I take comfort in that. How can we be better, though? Because what I posted this last week on our social media page was a statement that said, we don't need more Republicans and Democrats right now. Right now, our country needs more Christians. So what do we need to be? Because guess what? We have political leanings. We have political preferences. We have parties that we vote for one over another, typically speaking. That's not wrong. But what we need to make sure that we do in all of this is that we make sure we are reasonable people. That we use the scriptures as the basis 
of our lives and the road in which we travel, but we also are reasonable or logical about how we travel that road and our expectations of others. God would say, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Verse 19 reads, if you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord is spoken. What Jesus or what God was saying here under the law of Moses was, do what is good and you'll be rewarded. Do what is bad and you'll be punished. That's the logic of it all. Why is it that some people don't understand those basic principles? Why is it that they think if I do bad, I'll get rewarded? Well, you might in some ways, if you lie and cheat and steal in this world, you might get ahead. You might have more money at the end of the day. You might have more possessions at the end of the day. But I promise you, when eternity comes, you're not going anywhere but down. That's what God has taught us. And as a result of that, we need to understand the logic of that. When storm clouds come, don't we expect rain? When clear skies come, don't we expect the sun to shine? These are logical conclusions. And God wants us to be logical not only about the scriptures and how we apply it to our own lives, but he wants us to be logical and reasonable about how we share that truth with others so that they might follow it as well. How well does hypocrisy work in, in logic and reason? Not very well. Because guess what? I'm not going to convince somebody to walk in the footsteps of Jesus if I myself am not walking in the footsteps of Jesus. If I don't see that those steps are important enough for me, how can I convince you that it's important enough for you? And so there has to be a modicum of logic, of reason in what we do. Let me give you a, some New Testament examples of what I'm talking about, and then we'll return to the story. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul says to the young preacher Timothy, he says, for everything created by God is good. You know what that means? If you find anything out there that's evil, God didn't make it. If you find anything out there that's bad or contrary to his goodness, it didn't come from him. James would write in James 1.17, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So that tells me not only is God good, but he's consistent. What he says is wrong one day is wrong the next day. What he says is good one day is good the next day. What he tells us under the law of Christ that we need to do in order to obtain heaven by his grace and by his mercy is going to be consistent on the day of judgment when we face him. We don't have to worry about God saying this is what you need to do to be a Christian and you need to be faithful unto death and here's how you're faithful and then show up on the day of judgment and him say, you know, I changed the rules and those aren't applicable any longer. We don't have to worry about that. He doesn't change. He doesn't shift. He's not, he doesn't flip-flop like we do so often. I'm so wanting to mention something about Washington, D.C. right now, but I'm not going to do that. Except to say, how many of them today say that they are against something that we now, in this day and age of wonderful technology, have video and audio of them saying just four or eight or ten years or twelve years ago because a different guy was in office. Washington, D.C. flip-flops so unlike God never will. And that is a source of great comfort to know that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a good thing indeed. James would say, and we're going to use some of this scriptural logic to make a point, if God is good and everything God does is good and God doesn't shift like the shadows, James 1 and verse 13 reads, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. This is a demonstration of the not only the goodness of God, but the purity of God. That God is so good, number one, he will never tempt you or he will never solicit you to do evil. There's nothing in him that would want to do it. Remember, this is the God that the scriptures say not once but twice cannot lie. Why? Because there's nothing evil in him. It also says that God cannot be tempted by evil. He, we cannot solicit him to do evil. The devil can't solicit him to do evil. Why? Because there's nothing evil in him that would respond to that temptation. 
He is absolutely pure. So when we sin, guess what? We need to put blame where blame is due, and that's on us, not on God. It's not his fault, and you cannot blame him. There is no sin that exists in the world that is because of God. He is good. And the logical conclusion is that if there is something evil that exists in this world, then it came from someplace else, but not from him. All right, so let's take a look at our story for just a moment. Let's go back to, uh, as, uh, to John chapter 9, and let's take a look at some of the things that are going on here. In verse 24, the Pharisees say, Give the word of God. We know that this man is a sinner. Now that's what you call basically baiting the trap. That's what you call drawing a public conclusion in such a way that surely no one would argue with you. They just flat out say, let's give glory to God because we know Jesus is a sinner. It's just an absolute fact. <laughs> the man formerly blind turns around and says, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. And you know what? That was really pretty good because as we looked at last week at the end of the lesson, the blind man still really does not know who Jesus is. He's not a believer in Jesus. He was healed without faith. He was healed by the compassion of the Son of God. But he says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. I'm not God. I don't know his heart. I don't know this man. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Remember the old TV show, Just the Facts, ma'am? That's what he's given. That's what he's given, just the facts. He says, I don't know all the stuff you're talking about. Here's what I know. I've been blind since birth, and now I'm not. In verse 26, they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And I love this answer. I don't know if the guy's being sarcastic or not, but I just love the answer. He said, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become one of his disciples too, do you? <laughs> I mean, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Why do you keep asking me the same questions over and over again? I don't know if you have ever watched any of these videos on YouTube or something when a police officer uh, comes and pulls somebody over, but now people are traveling with cameras and dash cams and all these other things, and these uh, police officers will come, and they're just doing their job, but they're taught, in addition to pulling a person over for speeding or running a stop sign or making an illegal turn, they're also they're asking people questions because sometimes they can find more information uh, then perhaps the person ought to divulge without an attorney present. And so sometimes what happens is they keep asking the person over and over and over and over and over and over again for certain information. And there are some people who are getting wise to that and realizing I don't need to answer all of that information. I need to be helpful. I need to be cooperative. I need to be respectful. But I don't need to indict myself. I need to focus on what is at hand. And that's what we do. This is kind of interesting because this, this blind man, in one way or another, whether he's asking an innocent question or whether he is demonstrating his growing wisdom, he's wondering, why do you keep asking me the same thing? You asked me before. You've asked my parents. Now you're asking me again. Is that because you want to become a believer in this man too? <laughs> they didn't like his answer, and so they just basically say, you are his disciple. They just declare that. There's another one of their public truths that is not true. You are one of his disciples. We're disciples of Moses, but you're following this man. <laughs> they go on to say, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Listen to the logic that comes next. Listen to this. Pay attention. If you've got your Bibles, look at verse 30. The man answered and said to them, Remember, they have just said, we don't know where he comes from. They're drawing all these conclusions and trying to steer the conversation in the direction they want, but they don't know who this man is. They just admitted that. The man answered and said, well, here's an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from. And yet, if I can paraphrase this last part, it still doesn't change the fact that I can see it still doesn't change the fact that he healed me. It still doesn't change the fact that I'm no longer blind. I can now see. And then listen to the logic. Verse 31. We know that God does not answer or does not hear sinners. Now, 
This, interestingly enough, is sometimes something that people use as a New Testament precedent, but we have to remember that the blind man is saying this as a Jew under the law of Moses. And the law of Moses did teach this. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2 teaches, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, verse 2, and iniquities are sins, your sins have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Now this does not mean that God doesn't know that something's going on. God's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows everything that is ever said by anybody. But what it's saying is, he does not hear you as a father to a child, as was the case under the law of Moses to the children of Israel. He doesn't hear you, he doesn't listen to you in that way any longer, because you have decided to embrace your sin over him. And so as a result, he doesn't hear. Here is the application that the former blind man is saying. We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Do you hear the logic there? In other words, God does good things. The devil does bad things. Sinners do bad things. God doesn't do anything that's bad. If you're attributing this man's good actions to the devil, that doesn't make sense. That's not logical. Since this man did a good thing, we have to attribute its source to a good person. <laughs> Did, is everybody looking at verse 34? You don't want to miss this one. They answered him, you were born entirely in sin, and are you teaching us? So they put him out. We don't like what you're saying, so we're going to kick you out of here. We don't like what you're saying, we're going to get rid of you. In other words, we only surround ourselves with people who think the way we do. Can I mention Washington, D.C., or have I said that enough? Do you, get the, do you get the idea that that's on my mind just a little bit? But how many people in Washington are trying to surround themselves both now and forever with people who only think the way they do? And here's the problem. There is so much irrationale coming out of Washington, so much illogic coming out of Washington, that I don't even think they know sometimes what they believe and think. Why? Because yesterday was a different day today, and today is a different day from tomorrow. Isn't it wonderful when the logic that we hopefully possess and use is based upon Scripture that never, ever changes? It's based upon truth that was true in Genesis 1 and, and will be true through the end of time. It never changes because it's from God. It's a truth. You know, we passed out that track at the beginning of our, of our assembly time this morning entitled The One True Church. You want to know why that's such an, an, an important little document for you to read and study and, and check to see if it's true? Because it's talking about what Jesus said. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. Not my churches, not my many religions. He did not establish this concept that we're all going to heaven. We're just all going about it different ways. We're like spokes on a wheel. we got one hub, that's Jesus, but we're just going any way we want to and that's all good. He never taught that. For the last 2,000 years, there has been one church that belongs to Christ. Now here's the question for you. Are you a member of it? Or are you a member of a religion that began in the two and three hundreds? Are you a member of a religion that began in the 1500s or the 1600s or the 1700s or last Thursday? Because we've got a ton of religions that are cropping up left and right all over the place. Why? Because people are dissatisfied with God's will. They are dissatisfied with the word of God. And they want to create a religion that surrounds them and their thinking and their beliefs and their ideas. And not a one of those is going to save them in the end. Not a one of them. I found a couple of verses of Scripture in Job chapter 6 that I thought was just great. I, don't, I just don't remember these registering with me before. 
But in Job chapter 6 and verses 25 and 26, the, the, the statement is made, the exclamation is made, how painful are honest words. But what does your argument prove? Do you intend to reprove my words when the words of one in despair belong to the wind? Do you realize that's exactly what people are doing today? They're arguing with God, and that's not going to get them anywhere. So the Pharisees denied, denied, denied. What about the blind man? How did the former blind man accept Jesus as Lord? Because remember, up to this point, he really doesn't know who Jesus is. And in verses 35 through 38, we find that he accepted the evidence of both the miraculous power and authoritative words of Jesus. That's why he accepted Jesus. That's why he believed. Jesus simply asks him, do you believe in the Son of God? And the man's answer is, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Now, at this point in time, he does not understand and has probably not heard any or much of the teachings of Jesus. But he has certainly seen the power of Jesus. He has experienced that. So he's listening and Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and he is the one talking to you. Based upon the power and based upon what Jesus said in those very simple words, the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute because there are lots of illustrations of people who probably should have known better but who seemingly didn't have enough power until after the supernatural event. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 25 through 33, you remember the disciples out in the water? It was the fourth watch of the night, sometime after 3 a.m. in the morning, perhaps the darkest part of night, and Jesus comes walking to them on the water in the middle of a storm. They're scared to death, not only of the storm, but this ghost that they think is walking to them on the water. But he comes and he gets in the boat, and he makes that very famous statement, he, he makes that idea that, that you need to recognize that my power is greater than even those of this world, of this storm. When he got into the boat, we read that the wind stopped. And then it says, those who are in the boat worshiped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. We go forward into Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 9, when Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He's risen from the dead. He's walked out of the tomb, and we see those who are there and are witnessing this empty tomb. An angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said, Come, see the place where he was lying. And it's interesting that when Jesus shows up with all of his disciples but one, it reads in verse 9 that, Behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. He had been prophesying all along that this was going to happen, that he would rise on the third day, but perhaps they just hadn't fathomed this kind of amazement from the power of God and the words of the Lord. You know, I mentioned that there was one guy that wasn't there. That was good old Thomas, who will be forever known as Doubting Thomas. And although everybody else had seen Jesus and believed, they try explaining it to him and he doesn't believe. He flat out says, I'm not going to believe until I see the nail prints and until I put my hand in his side where the spear pierced him. Well, Jesus showed up and told Thomas, Thomas, do just that. Reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving but believing. And it's then that Jesus answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. But Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Do you realize that we will never see the Red Sea parted? Uh, we will never see someone walking on water without special effects from the movie industry. We're never going to see a truly dead man who's been dead and buried in the ground for days suddenly come back to life because he had the power to overcome it. We're not going to see that kind of power. But you want to know what's great? 
The next two verses read, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In other words, those stories of power have been written so that we can understand, appreciate, respect, and honor the authoritative words of our Lord. John would write in 1 John 5, verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, we're in the same boat. We can deny the evidence or we can accept it. But brethren, there's too much overwhelming logical evidence in Scripture for us to be deniers. We need to be acceptors. We need to be believers in the abundant information and evidence that God has provided us through faith in his word. The last three verses of Scripture in verses 39 through 41, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. There's that kind of paradoxical dis talking again where he says one thing and means another seemingly. But what he's talking about is he's not talking about the physically blind. He's talking about the spiritually blind. And that's where the misunderstanding comes into place because the Pharisees, once again, in an argumentative tone, they hear what he's saying and they say to him, we are not blind too, are you? Are we? The idea is they could see just fine. They, they had their eyes. They're not like this blind man was. We're able to see just fine. They're missing his point. And he says to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. In other words, he says, you simply don't understand what I'm talking about. Maybe if you do less talking and more listening, you'd figure it out. Maybe if you try to understand what I'm saying rather than attacking my teaching, then you might really have your eyes opened up. But all you can see right before you is the physical sight that your physical eyes give you. I'm trying to share with people the spiritual things that will open up their spiritual eyes to the everlasting consequence of sin, but the everlasting life that I hold in my hand. Will you just listen? so that you can see. You know, that's a good lesson for us today. That's a good lesson for us that will we open our eyes? Will we listen to what he has to say? Or are we going to be like so many? Are we going to be deniers of the Lord? Because we don't want to change. Because we don't want to give up what we think and what we want to say. We live in a country that has been blessed with freedoms. And it does seem over time that our freedoms seem to be being taken away from us. And some people are rebelling about that. But what's interesting is, in the Bible, you will never be truly free. Period. You simply have the freedom to choose whom you will serve. You can either be enslaved to sin and logically face the eternal consequences of sin being cast out of the presence of God into a devil's hell. Or you can do the other. You can open your eyes and see what Jesus was talking about and realize that there is hope thanks to his shed blood on the cross. There is hope thanks to the grace of God. This gift that they have made available to us, they do not force upon us. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit do not make us saved, nor do they make us remain saved. They give us the freedom to choose. And thanks to Jesus' sacrifice, we have the freedom to choose life. But the question is, how bad do we want it? Are we willing to give up the freedom in this world that the devil promises us to do whatever we want to, think whatever we want to, say whatever we want to, and then reap the whirlwind? Or... Will we give up those shackles of sin and take on the shackles, take on the chains of service to God? Something that is not bad, but only good. And if we as Christians suffer persecution in this life, that's okay. If we suffer hard times and loss, that's okay. Because we have the promise of, an, of a never-changing God that says, those tears will be wiped away. 
that pain will be dismissed. And I will welcome you into an eternal home where you will be able to see brilliantly for all of eternity. What will you do this morning? Don't remain blind. Give your life to God and let the Lord open your eyes. All together we stand and sing.